Hey everybody, welcome to the Ann Arbor District Library uh, YouTube channel. Tonight we're recording something about fantasy role-playing games. We're going to talk about improvising in fantasy role-playing games. My name is John Corey and I'm joined by Andy Rao. Hey Andy. Hey. Uh, Andy and I know each other. He has a podcast called Roll for Topic that I've appeared on in the past. It's great. You should check it out. Um, so what we're going to do today is we're going to do a non-game specific uh, fantasy Mad Lib. It's going to be how do you create an adventure from scratch? Just a totally improvised adventure. So what I thought we'd do is just walk you through it, Andy. Um, you're gonna play the role of a player. I'll be a little bit of a player. Um, and we'll talk about how we're gonna generate this adventure. So Sounds good. the idea is that we've come to this table, you, the game master, and a number of players, and you don't have a preset adventure. You're gonna make one up on the spot. And so this is a framework for doing that. Um, and I don't want to get into too much detail right now about why you would do that. We can talk about that later, but let's start by just, by just doing it. You know, you've sat down at my table, Andy, we're at, uh, we're at the library. It's RPG Fest post pandemic and we can, uh, we can play a fantasy RPG. And so when I say fantasy role-playing game, I mean a, a traditional one like Dungeons and Dragons. Um, that's sort of the context that we're talking about here, but again, this could be applied to any game. So what we're going to do collectively is you and I are going to fill out a sentence that describes our adventure. Okay. So yeah. I'll show you that sentence with blanks and then we'll fill in those blanks. Here is our start. Okay. So we, the adventure party are exploring a blank that lies blank. We are seeking blank. Uh, we are here to blank. It is guarded by blank and blank. Okay, so this is why it's a Mad Lib. We are going to fill this sentence out as we play. We're going to come up with characters, and then we're going to run through the adventure. All right? All right. So let's start by uh, looking at our first thing. Uh, oh, before I forget, let me do a little attribution here. I did not come up with this system all on my own. Uh, I got it from a site called RPG Alchemy. Uh, the create site's creator's name is John Lewis. Let me just zoom over to that. Uh, and you're welcome to check that out if that interests you. But let's just get started here, Andy. So okay. uh, we are exploring. I'm going to let you pick the first one, and I'm going to pick. We'll, we'll alternate. So what okay. would you like to be exploring? I would like to be. These are your choices. Yeah. OK. And let's see. A lot of good choices there. Let's go with uh, the capital of a mad ruler. The capital of a mad ruler. Okay, that's good. No one's ever picked that one before. All right. Okay. So the next part of the sentence is, where is this capital? So it lies, I'm going to pick this one. Um, I'm going to say in windswept badlands. Now, what I would normally do here um, is I would hand out little pieces of paper to each player. So if I had six players, each player would get one and they would all be picking something, but they wouldn't know what everyone else has picked. So we're sort oh, of interesting. breaking the magic a little bit by, but we, may, we might come up with something more coherent than we usually get. Yeah. Um, okay, so actually let's do a little out of order. So what are we here to do, Andy? All right, it's my turn. Um, yeah. We are here to... Ooh, we're here to conduct a sacred ritual. Okay. All right. Conduct a sacred ritual. All right. Okay. Um, then I'm going to take a turn here and I'm going to choose what are we seeking? So I already know about the ritual, but I'm going to try to. Uh, Let's see. Um, actually, you know, let's make this a little coherent. Let's do a, the crypt of a great hero. Okay. That's what we're going to do. Okay. And then we've got two more. What is guarding the crypt of the great hero? Uh, All right. Is... So we have two more. We're, uh, we have two things that are guarding it, right? So this is the front of them. Uh... Yes. Yeah, so okay. we sort of have a, have a minion that is guarding it. I don't know uh, what would you think would be a good thing to guard it. 
I think that Zealous Warriors. Yeah, Ze great. Okay. Yeah, Zealous Warriors. It was that or Crazed Cultists, but you know, cultists are kind of <laughs> passe these days. So Zealous Warriors. Yeah, yeah. That's old old news. Okay, Zealous Warriors. And finally, um, I'm gonna say uh, an infernal fiend. Okay. All right. Okay, so let's take a look at what we've come up with here. All right. So if we look at our sentence now that I've filled in the blanks, I don't know if I've spelled everything right, but we'll find out. Um, yeah, we are exploring the capital of a mad ruler that lies in windswept badlands, period. We are seeking the crypt of a great hero. We are here to conduct a sacred ritual. I'm gonna say the crypt is guarded by zealous warriors and an infernal fiend. So just like that, collectively you and I have come up with a plot for an adventure. Um, th and those are the basics of what we would do here. Now, what I would do next is then start asking you the players some questions about this game. And I will come up with some stuff too. Okay. Um, so for example, I would spread these out among the, the different players in the game. But what I might say in this example is, okay, Andy, um, the Crypt of the Great Hero, what did he die in a war? Did he defeat a, uh, a horrible monster that was going to wipe out the world? Did he slay a dragon? What is this hero uh, famous for? Okay. Um, so be, are you asking what, me that right now? Yeah. What would be okay. a good what would be a good thing for him to be famous for? He is famous for uh, let's say he's famous for uh, banishing or killing the uh, an infernal fiend, possibly the one that uh, ah. got into. All right. Um, and then I would ask another player, let's say I ask myself, John, um, what made the ruler go mad or did he start that way? Um, and I would say that um, the ruler had made a pact with the infernal fiend. And when it was banished, he went mad. Uh, okay, so now we're starting to come up with an adventure. We've got we've got a place. We've got a little bit of backstory, right? This mm -hmm. ruler that made the pact with the infernal fiend and the hero that banished the fiend. Um, uh, the crypt is guarded by zealous warriors. So maybe I would ask another player, why are these warriors so zealous? Um, and maybe it's because they uh, believe that the hero's crypt shouldn't be disturbed, or they believe that um, you know, you could turn it on its head. They could be good guys trying to prevent you from conducting this ritual because they think it's going to go bad. Um, another question I might ask is these are windswept badlands. Have they always been badlands? Um, and I would ask a player, what were they like before they were badlands? Um, those kind of questions sort of get the juices flowing. And then you've sort of got a, um, a, an adventure here and you've got your players involved in the game because they're helping you determine what this adventure is going to be like. Um, so one thing that we run into here is we have some very sort of nebulous um, adversaries, right? Does that, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. um, and there's different ways to do that. There's different ways to resolve, um, you know, sort of figuring that out. This is where your system and the, and the game you're playing has a little bit of impact. Um, I know how, how I would do this. Andy, do you have any ideas about how you might um, come up with adversaries here in this, you know, think about this again. We're playing a two or three hour game. It's a one shot. We've invited people um, yeah. and they've selected these things. So short of short of making up a monster for everything on this list, right? Because we have, you know, uh, just to look at the list again, yeah. you know, we could have we could have done, they could have picked any one of these, you know, 10, creatures and any one of of these 10 creatures and that's a lot of stuff to work up it is yeah um, so uh are you asking so is the challenge here that you know as the gm you really don't have any idea what the players are going to pick and there's no right. way you could have prepared all of the combinations of this in advance yeah, exactly i mean my my instinct especially 
if I were playing a game like Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder, where there's a little bit more uh, mechanical um, intensity, I guess, um, is I would probably come to the session with a couple of very generic bad guys uh, mm -hmm. uh, statted out, um, purposely very generic. And then as soon as the players started picking what the adversaries were going to be, I would just kind of just quickly, I guess, skin or theme my generic bad guys to reflect what they chose. So if the characters wind up uh, determining that we'll be in, in, invading a temple of fishmen, mm -hmm. I, mean, I probably don't have a fishman stats memorized, but I can look at my... I'd be impressed if you did, though. I, I know. Maybe that's a, <laughs> a goal for, for the new year I should set for myself. But... Uh, you know, but I can look at, you know, generic minion enemy and just, um, just, you know, uh, flavor it with description to be a fishman instead of whatever it started out as. Right. So fishmen and kobolds and goblins are kind of, they're all minions. Yeah. But, you know, goblins like to tunnel and fishmen have tridents and kobolds like to build things and, you know, whatever that, whatever flavor you need to add, but statistically they're all very similar. Yeah, exactly. Is and you can, saying. Okay. Yeah. And you have a, uh, you know, Maybe stat yourself up a mini boss, a generic mini boss, and some sort of uh, final boss in the same way, keeping it fairly generic and just theming a few of the powers. Anyway, that's that's how I would just do it, kind of instinctively. But I'd like mm -hmm. to hear how you might approach it, this as well. No, I think that's a good idea, and you'll notice in this in this um, scenario we just have minions and a boss because it's assumed to be sort of a shorter yeah. scenario. So. I think the boss, again, like you suggested, is just going to be more powerful and you're going to have to scale it to, if you're playing a game with levels, not all games have levels, but you're going to have to scale it to the level you're playing. Um, the nice thing is if it's a dragon or something or a demon, those scale, right? So there's, yeah. there's little demons and big demons and young dragons and old dragons. And so you can just use that to do some scaling too. Um, but yeah. And I always used to, um, when I would do this, I would have sort of a minion set up, a, a trap set up, and a, and a boss set up, right? And then I would, and those would be statistical things that I would do, and then I would just modify them uh, for whatever was appropriate. Was it a pit trap or a falling wall or, or whatever, something to, to create interest? And then you go in having a few tools to, to make the adventure go. Yeah, so, that makes sense. So th that is the very rough basics of how we would um, how we would set this up. Um, yeah. Do you have any questions at this point? So I've done this a dozen times, and to me, this is all really simple. But yeah, yeah I mean, what's you know? Do you have any? What's your first thought when you see this? Yeah, movie? a couple of questions do spring to mind. But here's a real basic one. So since I've met you and I've I've heard and I've I've witnessed your um, your improv style of jamming in person. I've gotten to know a little bit more about this, but this is not the way I prepare for my games. I am right. an old school, spend hours reading through stats and uh, that sort of thing in advance. So can you tell me, make a, can you make a pitch to me why I should, what will I get out of abandoning the prep work that I do right now mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. uh, and trusting in this improv? Oh, uh, okay. Setup? All right, that's a great question. Um, I'll say a few things about that. Um, I think the first thing I'll say is just in my own experience, I'll, do, I'll tell you a brief story of my own jamming and why I came to this, and, and maybe that'll help. And then I've got a couple other things I can add to that. But just to start it, is I um, used, to, I've jammed for a long time, and I come from a, the background of the original D&D, where it's a lot of adventures and traps and puzzles and mysteries and if the players don't figure it out that's too bad and it should be challenging and difficult you know the tomb of horrors kind of stuff and i just recall one time making what i thought was just the cleverest trap they're never going to get through this door they'll never figure out this mystery and my math genius friend steve figuring it out in 15 seconds and thinking <laughs> i put hours into that and he just murdered my um and so for a long time, I thought I just wasn't good at GMing, right? Because I'm not good at that particular kind of GMing. Um, I don't particularly like to run prepared adventures um, either. So when I discovered this method, it really opened up a, a world of gaming to me that I hadn't seen before. And it's really about, I think, ultimately finding a style that suits who you are as a person. Um, there are a ton of videos. You know, Matt Colville runs a great series of videos on how to run D&D &D and role-playing games. But 
that's not the only way to run them. And I and what I, I guess what I wanted to point out here is that there's a different ways to do it. And here is one. Yeah. Um, there's another big reason that I well, there's two other reasons that I really like. One is, um, well, let me ask you, did you when I started asking you questions, you know, your first response was, are you asking me this right now? Like it probably created a little, a little anxiety or a little, little nerves, right? Um, <laughs> yeah. You weren't maybe expecting me to ask you to fill in pieces of the story. Yeah. Is that yeah. true? So it, it's definitely true. Yeah. So I think what that can do is though that's a little anxiety producing, what it also does is it creates a lot of energy, right? So you the energy level, everyone at the table sort of goes up when you do this kind of collaborative storytelling, right? And you can use that energy if you don't know what's going to happen um it is much harder for the adventure to be stale yeah. now that prevents some kind of adventures right so you can't do complex murder mysteries for example with an improv like this like maybe you could if you were really good at murder mysteries but i would not be able to hmm. so and you'll notice if i can pull up our sentence here again um if i can find it so this sentence is designed to be very specific it is structured so that you're not going to do just anything, right? You're going to be a group of adventurers who's going somewhere to look for something, do something in that place, and combat the creatures in that place, mm -hmm. right? So, you know, there's not there's not a lot of variation on that. So it does create a structure which makes the improvising easier, right? If I were to say, just make it up and ask questions and have people figure out what they want to do, that would be much harder. Um, and that's not what I'm advocating. What I'm advocating is creating a structure uh, because what it does is it gives you that energy to create a really energetic and interesting story that, um, that keeps people engaged. Um, and the last thing I'll say is, the thing I love about this is the collaborative storytelling, right? Now I've got you to fill in parts of the world and that does two things. One, it makes my job easier, but more importantly, yeah. uh, as a player, you are, more invested in the outcome, right? Because you now you've now you have said, um, you know, you've chosen zealous warriors. Now you want to know what these zealous warriors are like, right? You have some interest in the game and what that's going to be, um, and I think that's just a fun way uh, to get players interested. Uh, uh, there's there's sort of two contexts I'll run this in. One is at a convention, right? If I want to introduce some people to a new game and to this idea of improving, I'll I'll do that. Um, I ran something similar at uh, the Library RPG Fest, hmm. um, and that was very fun. Uh, or I'll also do it as an icebreaker, right? New players who don't know each other, this is a great way to get everybody involved. Um, and I will say it's not for everybody. I've had players come to my games and realize that I was relying on them to provide details of the world and things to do, and they just wanted no part of that, and that's okay. Um, and that's a perfectly valid way to play, but this is just something else I sort of wanted to offer up to everybody as yeah. a, as a possibility. Something you said earlier, uh, stuck, stuck with me and that is this, um, this would be a neat way to be able to be surprised as a GM by yeah. the game. Uh, yeah. you know, players are used to not knowing what's going on and, and being excited to discover what's in store for them, but that's not a feeling that GMs have very often. So even if you you, the GM, you know all of those options that they could choose. It's, you know, you certainly have not prepared for the combination of options that the players are going to choose. Is that right? It's a... Exactly. And I think, I think that can make your game more fun, right? Because you get these moments. You don't think it's going to happen, but you go, how the hell am I going to pull together Zealous Warriors and Infernal Fiend? And you won't even know. You'll be halfway through the adventure and you won't know what's going on. And then bang, it'll hit you. And it's exciting. And that makes your description and the play really exciting. Um, and that can be really fun. So one just real quick uh, practical question. How did you come up with all of the options? That, so, so each of uh, those had maybe like half a dozen or so options. How did yeah, you come up with those? So, so the, um, that's a great question. So I, I downloaded it from that site I mentioned earlier. And that's where the original version that I got came from. Um, and then over the years, I've just added new ones. So just looking at, um, let's take a peek at that again, just because I'm curious to see which ones I've added. I've just added some that interest me. Uh, so for example, I had, um, there was a, everybody used to choose a remote necropolis. So for a while, I actually <laughs> took that out. Um, but you know, the floating castle, I've added that one, uh, yeah. the legendary battle site. Um, 
other ones, you know, again, this list was mostly here, but I added uh, the Vault of the Last Dwarven King and a Temple of the Old Ones um, or the Castle of the Queen of Winter. Whenever I roll that one out, I get a lot of frozen jokes. So yeah. I, I just, <laughs> w what I did and what was done, I think, was to take a selection of just stories that you've read before, right? A floating castle. Um, you know, that's from a lot of things. You know, there's a lot of stories with floating castles in them or dark, dreary swamps or ancient forests or ancient battlegrounds. There's, you know, old D&D &D games that I've run that have all those things in them. So I think it's, it's about taking from other media or other games and bringing it in here. And actually that, that's a great question because it sort of brings me into, because what that question is partially is like, how do you, how do you create this story? How do you improvise, right? Um, do you, have you done a lot of improvisation in RPGs? Do you, you're a big, are you a big prep person or? A, I'm a big, a... Uh, well, I don't know. I guess uh, I try to be a prep person and mm -hmm. I hesitate to call uh, what I do improv because it feels more like desperately scrambling for <laughs> uh, ideas and details on the spot. Right. Uh, I would love, you know, I would love to have more confidence in my ability to on the spot, just like riff off of what the players are saying rather than like, you know, frantically flip, flip through my notes to try and figure out uh, what to do next, I guess. So yeah. no, not a lot of like intentional improv and, um, and yeah, I don't know, for me, the word improv, I, I enjoy watching a good improv comedy, but the idea of doing it uh, fills me with a little bit of uh, trepidation, so. Right, right. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think, I think the secret to this improv is the same as the secret to improv comedy, which is just improv comics are falling back on, they're not making things up out of whole cloth, right? So there's two big things that, that you can do to make this easier for yourself. First is the reason this is a Mad Lib and just not a free for all, right? Is it creates a structure, right? I have a structure for an adventure. I've run that adventure before. The details are different, but I know, I know the basic structure, right? Um, and then secondly, uh, steel. Right. I think this is the important thing. I think sometimes, I don't know how you feel about this. As a GM, I feel used to feel like I had to come up with original stories all the time. Yeah. Um, but now, like for example, whenever that swamp, there was the edge of a swamp was one of the choices, right? And I read this book uh, in the 1970s about a sorcerer who built a, you know, was rebuilding an ancient city at the heart of a swamp, and he had like these toad-like creatures who were guarding the place for him and. Um, I probably tried that. And, and as the city was becoming complete, it, you know, it, it was this power grid too that energized. And once he completed it, it was going to be, you know, become an unholy portal or whatever I needed it to be. And yeah. I've tried that plot out half a dozen times, right? You know, just <laughs> this great. comfort, just taking plots from all the stuff you've consumed as a, as a fellow nerd um, makes this a lot easier. And I think it's really, uh, I don't think most people care. I think most people come to the table wanting to emulate the genre of fantasy adventure and if if they have if they're having fun and they have a wacky character and other people they can interact with the fact that the the plot is not that complex in this case or has been trodden many times i don't think matters too much right mm -hmm. i think i think worrying about being original is is keeping you from um not you personally but <laughs> <laughs> well, keeping people from coming up with adventures because they feel they're not uh, original enough or something like that if that makes any sense totally do you do you find that players typically respond well to this like is it is yeah. it delta players or do you have people go like hemming and hawing um uh, being asked by the gm to to share right. that kind of idea you know and i i'll tell you about a game i ran this a few years ago at a, at a uh, um, game convention in kalamazoo michigan and at that table it was a four-hour game and we took a break in the middle. Um, and at that table were two people who were very old, old school RPGers. They were, they had played a lot of traditional RPGs. And one of them said to me um, halfway through, he was like, I, is it okay if I go? I just, this is not really for me, you know? And I was like, fine. And then 
the other guy who was even older school, this this guy had signed up thinking he was playing Dungeon Crawl Classics. Okay. Not not uh, not a Mad Lib improv. He didn't yeah. understand what he'd signed up for. At the end of the game, he looked at me and said, that was one of the best games I've ever played. So, oh, you know, wow. it, it depends on the person. I find about 70, 80% of people really go for it. Yeah. And the other people, um, that's fine. I think they were looking, you know, one person I had who really struggled with it, it was their first time they had watched D D on twitch but wow. hadn't played and so they had an expectation i think that was stronger than a lot of people's um yeah. i like to play this with new players that don't have a lot of expectations i think that helps a lot too um and it helps if you're kind of free and easy with the rules as well i think this works less well for pathfinder though if you're a real master of pathfinder i think you could you could make it work too yeah so. this seems uh this seems like uh a a setup that would work really well. Like I have kids, both of whom are sort of gameable age that I'm always looking for ways to invite them into, you know, my hobby. This seems like it would be pretty fun to try with my kids actually. I did, you know what I ran, I did this once for a 10 year old's birthday party and it was a hoot. They, they went crazy. They, oh, I... they asked me if they could substitute things. Normally I don't allow that because yeah. who knows what somebody's going to come up with, but they right. it was like some giant purple owl was the, <laughs> yeah. was the big bad and, you know, like all kinds yeah. of crazy stuff. And they just had a great time. So I think, yeah, this is great for kids. Yeah. Um, and I think they are much less inhibited about it than, uh, than us older folks. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. So, well, yeah, all right. I, I will have to give this a try and I'll let you know how it went. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks, Andy. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Um, and there'll be more RPG content this month. Thank you very much. And thank you to the library for allowing us to do this. All right, Andy, talk to you soon. Take care. See you later.